Hello and welcome to Must Read Fiction, a place for people who know that life is better with a novel in hand. I'm Erin Papelka, and I'm so delighted to be here today with author Sergio Trancoso. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to Must Read Fiction. I'm excited to be on here. Oh, it's truly my pleasure. So uh, a little bit about you. Um, Sergio Trancoso is most recently the author of A Peculiar Kind of Immigrant Son, this gorgeous book I have right here, which was also named as one of the 30 most anticipated fiction books of fall 2019 by Kirkus Reviews. Um, he is the son of Mexican immigrants um, and grew up in El Paso. He graduated from Harvard College and also received two graduate degrees from Yale University in international relations and philosophy. He was inducted into the Texas Institute of Letters and is currently the vice president of the TIL. For many years, he has taught at the Yale Writers Workshop. And you can learn more at his website, sergiotroncoso.com. Um, so I, we have so much good stuff to talk about, but let's just start with this gorgeous book that I have right in, here in my hands. Please tell me about A Peculiar Kind of Immigrant Son. Well, you know, it's a book of 13 linked short stories on immigration and Mexican-American diaspora. And, and what I mean simply is um, these are different stories on immigrants, and not all Mexican-Americans, but mostly Mexican-Americans, that have gone beyond the border, have gone into the United States to try to assimilate, to try to be part of this country, and to Connecticut, to New York, to even the Midwest, to places where maybe traditionally they haven't been, and, and the struggles they face, the, the successes, the failures they have, the dreams that they want uh, as, as new Americans, so to speak. And so that's really what the, and these 13 stories really are a whole. In a way, I, I, I mentioned this before um, in, uh, in another talk I gave, that it's almost like a musical album uh, with a certain vision and a certain message. And so all these 13 stories do fit together into that puzzle. Mm, oh, that's actually a really beautiful metaphor because with an album, certainly each of the songs on the album can stand alone and often do, but there is a real magic to when the whole album is consumed all in one go. So can you tell me more about like how those link stories kind of play off each other and those different points of view and why you chose that approach? Well, so the interesting thing that when you look at the book, and, mm -hmm. and sometimes people don't, don't pay attention to the table of contents, although just, but the table of contents, the, the stories are actually grouped together in different groups. And it does matter uh, what group you're in because the characters appear and reappear within, for example, the first group, there are two stories, Rosary on the Border in New Englander. And so this character, David Calderon, appears in the first story. And in a way, he's, he's going back to uh, the funeral of his father. And he's remembering really how he felt on the border. He was already displaced even while he was on the border, while he was growing up in Isleta. Um, and, and certain things displaced him. It could be his perseverance, his intelligence, and, and luck in, in, in many ways. But then on the next story, he reappears and he He's in New England, he's in Kent, Connecticut, and he's established himself there. And yet he's remembering the values that he learned on the border, he's taking the border with him. And then he's, he has to face a difficult situation with someone who, who really attempts to attack him um, for who he is, for the back, you know, the, the ethnicity, the, the, the heritage that he has. So he has to respond to that. So it's so these sort of the different perspectives in each story as you go to the different groups are giving you a, a refracted vision in a way of a character. So you think as a reader, oh, this character might be a favorable character, but then in the next story, from a different point of view, it may be a little bit more critical. It may be a character that um, you know you want to criticize, and maybe he's not completely positive or she is not completely a positive character and has some other wrinkles and maybe something worse than wrinkles uh, in, in that character. So that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to play with perspectivism. One of my philosophy degrees, uh, I studied uh, German philosophy, Nietzsche and Heidegger and, and all of these people. And so I love philosophy and literature. And that's one of the things I'm trying to do in this collection give you a story about immigrants, give you a story about El Paso and, and immigrants in this country, but also tell you how 
um, readers uh, and writers manipulate uh, characters as they read a story, as they write a story, and how these changes um, are about us. You know, we are all many different human beings at the same time. You know, I am uh, Sergio uh, of 50 years ago when I was growing up in El Paso. I'm also Sergio, who now teaches at Yale. I'm also Sergio, who's in Denver right now, <laughs> you know, at a sure. conference. And so it's, it's the present and it's the future and it's the past all coming together and you're trying to bring it together as one identity. Mm -hmm. And so th this is why these stories are grouped together in different groups and why these characters appear and reappear to play with that, with that sense of time and perspective on characters. I don't know if that makes sense. Oh, it really does. And it actually raises some really interesting questions for me, too, because I think I have long believed that fiction is a really fantastic way to kind of shed our skins and get into the perspective of another, right? That, you know, that it's a really fabulous um, conduit for empathy in terms of just getting a sense of a different perspective. Um, but what's interesting with what you're playing with here is like, even with that shared perspective, we still are filtering all of those stories through our own experience, through our own knowledge, right. through our own stereotypes and biases, positive or negative. And so in doing so, you both are kind of shaking up like the assumptions that we might make about a character, which in turn is also shaking up the assumptions that we're making that we carry ourselves. So I think you're doing like a really interesting magic trick with that because it's both working with the characters on the page, but you're also kind of playing with the reader. Is that something right. that you were kind of conscious of? Oh, absolutely. Because, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm a little bit of a, of a rebel. <laughs> and I like to, I like to unmoor the reader a little bit. You know, for me, it's really just not about telling entertaining stories about where I grew up or, or and all of that is in there. It's also about the, how narrative uh, really changes and, and questions who you are as a reader. You know, who, it starts prompting questions of where do I belong? Who am I really? Am I this past person? Am I this person who really loved the David Calderon in the first story, but then uh, did not quite like the David Calderon in the second story, and yet they're still the same character? So it does, it, I think that's really such an acute observation that it really does turn the lens back into the reader. Um, and, and that's what I am trying to do as, as someone who loves reading and writing philosophy and literature, it is more than just storytelling. It's more than just entertaining. It's really also, you know, in a sneaky way, trying to get into the reader's mind and, sure. and, 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 and make them, you know, make, make, make that great reader think about uh, what they bring, the software they bring to each story. Uh, and, and think about your own prejudices, think about your own biases, Think about the, the things you find automatically favorable or unfavorable when you're reading a character. And so all of this, I definitely am trying to do on purpose. And, and you see it towards the end where uh, in the last group of stories, or the penultimate group of stories, where literally the reader is bringing back to life um, one of the characters in the story. And so I am, I am a little bit of a, <laughs> of, a, of a rebel and trying to have all these kind of sneaky um, puzzles for the reader and by the way there are some puzzles in the <laughs> that I'm not going to tell you sure uh, but but I want the reader to to solve them there are some interesting puzzles and I'm even my publisher does not know of some of these puzzles that I put in there uh, on these 13 stories Oh, amazing, amazing. Well, that actually is really enticing, too, because it, it gives, like, an obligation to the reader, too, right? Like, you aren't just passively absorbing it. Like, you've exactly. got a job in the engagement right. of this work, so. And, 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 and you, know, you know where that comes from? It comes from close reading. Like, mm -hmm. as, a, as a, you know, uh, when I was a graduate student at Yale in philosophy, we spent, I think, three months on two paragraphs in Aristotle's physics. I mean, that is close reading. And I think yeah. that's something we're losing in the United States. You know, people, because of the iPhone and, and, and just the visual culture we live in, you know, close reading is going by the wayside. And, and you get so, uh, such an immersion, especially if you have a writer that has taken the time to, to do all sorts of interesting things, but it's, they're only, they will only be captured by that close reader. They will, mm -hmm. these, these gems will only be found by someone who pays attention 
Mm -hmm. And you do get a sense of that in the writing sometimes too, when, when the author comes in with a higher expectation of the reader, like as a reader, I find myself take like sit up a little bit and take notice and say, oh, this, this isn't for like, you know, after I've had a glass of wine and I just want to chill out at the end of the day, like, you know, this makes me bring almost more of my best self to the work because it's asking something of me, which is also a really interesting charge. Yeah, no, and 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 you know, and and I'm loyal to every reader I have, and and I do have these readers that I have long conversations with that that send me emails, and I answer all my emails, and so I feel an obligation to those people who really do pay attention to storytelling and people playing with the craft, because I I try different parts of, for example, stream of consciousness stories or regular third person stories. You know, uh, told in a third person, and um, and then other stories that are mostly dialogue. And so I am on purpose trying to show the reader the different crafts and possibilities within a story, all within this album that I've created on immigrants and and Mexican immigrants. You know, trying to join America. Mm, super interesting. Well, thank you, thank you for going on that journey and for for sharing it with us so that we get to go along with it and figure out your puzzles as best we can. Um, so I wanted to spend a little bit more time. You gave an interview to the Lone Star Literary Life, and I'm going to read a quote back to you from that interview. Um, you said, "I think the key to taking particular histories and making them universal is the writer's self awareness." My experience is universal in this way. Whoever leaves home and finds the need to either return home or to find a new one, these individuals will connect with my stories. Whoever feels at the same time emboldened but also disheartened by their lives in an immigrant community, these readers will find a home in my stories. And so I was hoping that you could speak a little bit more to that quote and this question of home, both in the really broad general sense that's something I think all of all humans kind of try and figure out like what is home, but also specifically with immigrant communities. That's a really compelling question. Well, you know, for, for me, it, it all began with this sort of the stark jump I made. I, you know, I began on the border. Uh, my parents were Mexican immigrants that came over in the 50s. And, and we started out without electricity uh, and an outhouse in the backyard. And, but I was a bookworm. So in, in, a, in, a, um, in, a, in a little neighborhood that was full of gangs. And, and I loved, by the way, the, the first book I loved was Essie Hinton. That was then, this is now in The Outsiders, because that was my life. It was pony boy and gangs and, and you know, just trying to make myself uh, in that kind of situation that was very stark. And, and I could, as I told many people uh, from my, um, to paraphrase Tina Fey as Sarah Palin, I could see Mexico from my house. Mm, sure. uh, and, and so from that beginning, I went to Harvard and I went to Yale. So it was kind of a wrenching, people say, oh, that's wonderful, great opportunity. But it was also a wrenching experience. Sure. I, um, you know, I had to learn. I, I thought everybody in the United States was bilingual, you know, and I ended up at Harvard and I was shocked that they weren't. I didn't know Boston was, was cold. And so I arrived without, I arrived uh, with Led Zeppelin t-shirts and bell-bottom jeans. And I had to buy a, a coat uh, at a used clothing shop because it started to snow. And sure. So, so, so it was every cultural uh, adaptation from linguistic to intellectual to finding out how do, how do I write a research paper? I wasn't taught this, you know, back, back in El Paso or back in Isleta, um, or at least not at that level that I had to learn at Harvard. So all of this prompted these questions of what happened to me when I left home. And all of us really, maybe we don't have that kind of stark leaving of home, but all of us were children in a place where we belonged, where we felt at home, if, you know, if we, if we had certainly had a good family life. And then we left, or we may have left and come back. And, and, and I think that's why these stories, I think, should appeal to any reader. Because what happens is, you tr if you have the time and you have the ability, you want to, to go back and see, well, what am I picking and choosing from the home I left? Like, one of the things I definitely chose that I learned from my parents is a work ethic. To work until you drop. To, and I mean Saturdays and Sundays. I mean in the summer. You know, my, my, I had kids in New York City, and, uh, and that's where my kids were raised. And I said, you guys are too soft. You know, the kids from New York City, they really do not understand uh, what it is to work uh, 20 hours a day. 
And that's something my parents taught me, that these immigrant values that I learned from my parents that I applied intellectually at Harvard. You know, I would stay until the, the, the libraries would close because I was terrified of failing. I would not fail. I would rather have a heart attack than fail. And so, so this, these kind of values that I tried to teach to my children when they were in New York City are actually very good values and sometimes values that, that, um, you know, that, that, that I think are forgotten in this country uh, by people who have a lot of privilege, who, who assume that they should be here and should get every, everything easy. Um, and I think one of the things that I discarded from home, so you know, I certainly adapted and kept many things from home, was like the machismo. So, and a, a lot of us may, may have that. You know, I, I, uh, the strongest uh, heroines I had in El Paso were women. Uh, my grandmother from my mother's side, this uh, tough old lady who um, survived the Mexican Revolution, she had shot and killed two men who attempted to rape her. That was the, that was the lore of the, in the family. So I would bike from Isleta to downtown El Paso to listen to her stories. She would be smoking her cigarette and drinking her coffee, and we would go to two in the morning under the desert stars, and people would come from her tenement where she lived to listen to her stories. So there were, there were usually six or seven people all listening to these stories about surviving the Mexican Revolution, Pancho Villa coming in Chihuahua and stringing up lawyers and bankers by telegraph wire. Because uh, this was, you know, this was severe conflict. And so, of course, as a kid, I loved these violent stories. And she was there. So it was more, it was real. And, 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 and so the very first story I wrote when I later got to Yale was called the Abuelita, the grandmother, because I wanted people not to forget her. So, so but one of the things I, I discarded were my parents and my mother's, I mean, my, my father's machismo. You know, I thought he mis not didn't mistreat women, but treated women in a in a lesser way, sort of assuming that they had a certain role rather than have that freedom. And and yet he would never do that with my grandmother because my grandmother would would attack. And so and that's what I loved about my grandmother that she defended herself, um, and and uh, and you know tried to teach others to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. So so I think some things I adapted from leaving home and some things I discarded from leaving home. And so I think anyone that has gone through that process of 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 keeping the things that you loved about your growing up and then making your own identity as you grew up and as you you know got older, I think these stories will be perfect for you. Oh, really, really fascinating. And thank you for sharing some of those stories from your grandmother. Are there any other stories of hers that have stuck with you? I'm sort of, I just love to hear like good stories. Like, are there yeah. any other ones you might be willing to share with us? Well, she was, she was the boss in her household. Just watching her was watching a story. Um, I, my grandfather, who was a really good, good guy, uh, very genial, the opposite of her. Uh, she was this, you know, he, he was very funny and always kind of, and I think he needed the humor to deal with her because she was this really strong personality that my own parents were scared of. Um, and so if my grandfather did not hand over his, his, his check or his, you know, money, she would take a broom and hit him on the head. I mean, with it, I mean, I'm telling you, this was feminism, you know, <laughs> 1.0. Sure. This was, this was no messing around. And so, so the, you know, I would hang around with her and, uh, and, and sort of listen to her uh, different stories coming across the border. You know, they didn't have, uh, my mother would tell us, uh, you know, her daughter, that they did not have um, shoes until they were 12 years old. And so, so learning to live like that and then, and then making your life better by coming to the United States, by working until you were exhausted. Um, that's the only way that they knew how to improve themselves and how to move up, up, up in life. Um, so that was, you know, th those were some stories of, of her. I, I also, I think another person that was very influential in my early storytelling was my grandfather on my father's side. And he was more intellectual. He was not this visceral, uh, tough uh, person. He was uh, uh, Santiago Troncoso. My grandmother, by the way, on my mother's side was uh, Dolores Rivero. And by the way, if you notice in, in A Peculiar Kind of Immigrant Son, mm -hmm. dedicated to her, among other people. Mm, 
lovely. Dedicated to my grandmother and my grandfather on my mother's side. Oh, beautiful. Uh, but but my grandfather on my father's side, Santiago Troncoso, he was editor and publisher of El Dia, uh, the first daily newspaper in Juarez, uh, Mexico. And it was in the 1920s and 30s. And he was this kind of rabble-rousing Mexican journalist that would write critical articles against the uh, Mexican government corruption. He got into fights with the governor of Chihuahua, and they threw him in jail something like 28 times and firebombed his print shop, I think, three times. Uh, today, they would have just killed him. You know, back then, it was a more soft violence, so to speak. And so he, he was also, you know, a character. And when I was uh, getting into uh, the newspaper, the high school newspaper business, I became editor of my high school newspaper. He told me, and I went to talk to him, I said I was interested in becoming a journalist. And he said, don't become a journalist, because if you tell the truth, people will hate you forever. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he had a, a tough life, and he still yeah. did it. He never, yeah. backed, he never backed down, but, yeah. but, but he, you know, he, he told it the way he saw it. And it didn't matter what happened to him. And for him, freedom of the press, that's what it meant. And, and you know, if you're going to write something, you might as well be writing something that's true, that upsets people, that gets people to think. Mm-hmm. And that's certainly, all these, these things I got both from my maternal grandmother and from my paternal grandfather, you know, that if you're going to do this, you do it for the right reasons. Don't do it just for entertainment purposes or mm-hmm. for you know, keeping people happy. Do it because you want to tell something that's never been done before. Mm-hmm. Do it because you want to wake people up. You want to tell them, pay attention to these immigrant values. They may actually be useful to you, and you may be thousands of miles away from a Mexican immigrant, or you may not even know any Mexican immigrant. But the values that, about survival, about making sense of home, about family values of togetherness and fighting together to survive. All of these are good values for everybody, not just Mexican immigrants. Oh, so interesting and such good stories. And and it ties into like our earlier conversation about you being a rebel and you really asking a lot of your reader and like just trying to get to the truth, but in a different way that's not journalism, that's through fiction. So I love that literally on both sides of your family, you're getting that rebellion and that storytelling and that love of words. And so it's like, you know, of course you wrote this fantastic book right here, you know, and so that's, that's so, so great. And so, um, just to close as my last question, like returning to the book, like, and knowing that you're going to ask a lot of your readers, but what questions or ideas do you hope that readers walk away with after they read A Peculiar Kind of Immigrant Son? Well, I hope that the, some of the questions that they think about are like, who are you? Are you who your past? Are you a mix of your present? Are you who you want to be, that aspirational future self? Um, and, and the same thing of the characters. I'm asking the same thing of characters. Who are you? And how do you make this center that's called the self, that's called who I am as you go through life? I think that's certainly one of the questions. And, and how do you, can you return home? You know, what, what do you pick and choose from the home, whatever home you, you started with? Uh, the good values and then adapt them to something else in New York City or whether you're in Portland, Oregon or wherever you're at. Um, you know, what do you, what do you keep and what do you discard and why do you do that? Um, and, and then I, probably the last question, which has to do with the dystopian element of the, of the last stories, is what is this country becoming if it becomes even more anti-immigrant, if, you know, we don't reach out in an empathetic way to try to understand someone that's different from us? So, uh, you know, and, and that, that's, that, that's a, a cause for everyone, for me, for you. You know, my wife is Jewish from Concord, Massachusetts, and she thought I was Greek uh, when she met me. <laughs> I'm not Greek, I'm Mexican. Um, and, and I've learned a lot, a lot about the Jewish culture and, and Jewish community simply by going to High Holy Day. And I didn't convert. But all of us, you know, if you um, don't know African-Americans, how do you make an effort to learn more about the community? Or if you grew up in Portland, Oregon, and you don't know uh, people from a different background, uh, wherever they're from or from a different region, how do you make the effort to be empathetic? You know, to, because I think that's the, the greatest 
question and problem we have in this country. How are we going to stay a we in this country? You know, how, and we, and it's about reaching out. It's about being empathetic. It's about reading about other cultures and trying to understand them in the complexity of it. And not by telling propaganda, because I certainly, you'll see in my, in my story, it, they don't always, uh, my Mexican immigrant character are not always positive, not always doing the, the best thing. They're, they're struggling just like you are and just like I am. And so, so I think that's the, the question that I want to ask readers at the end. You know, what kind of country are we going to have if we, if we keep stereotyping each other rather than reaching out, rather than meeting someone and, and engaging with them and finding out not from the television set and not from some sort of radio host tells you what a, an immigrant or a Mexican immigrant is, but you go out and talk to them. You go out and meet them. You go out and exchange ideas and issues with them, and you'll see they love their families. They want to survive. They want to work hard. The vast majority of them, they, 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 you know, they're honest. They simply want a chance to, to be, be successful in this country. And you do have your bad eggs, but you have those bad eggs everywhere. And so, so I think that that's the question that I want readers to, to come out with, you know, and it's a call to action in a way. I mean, the end of the short story collection is a call to action to ask you to engage with other people that you may not be familiar with. And that's how we create a community. Oh, fantastic. Well, consider us called to action. So Must Reader, um, A Peculiar Kind of Immigrant Son by Sergio Troncoso. Thank you for writing it. Thank you for calling us to action. And thank you so very much for taking the time to speak with me today. This was an absolutely fantastic conversation. Erin, uh, you're a gracious host and I love being on your program. Thank you for inviting me. Truly my pleasure, thank you.